think I first got in the stock market in 1987. So, of course, everyone, as soon as they hear stock market in 1987, you all know about the crash, but I didn't know the crash was coming. Um, I was just a teenage boy. I was interested in stocks and shares, and my folks didn't know anything about that, so I asked the math teacher. And the math teacher said, oh, there's this big thing, it's called AIDS. It's happening now, like, you know, 85, 86. And so I reckon investing into rubber gloves, like Ansel, rubber gloves and condoms is going to be the way to go. Because I was a teenage boy, condoms, that made me smile. <laughs> I'm going to invest in that. Um, the interesting thing is, okay, here's, where, where's our stock market, guys? Crashing. You got shares? Who's the, who's the big share guy? Oh, Just Bob? No one else has got shares in anything? <laughs> Everyone sold all their shares. Okay. And, and you got shares in that or? Okay. Sorry, what was your name? Carol. Carol. Okay, Carol, you're gonna be you're gonna be my stock market person. All right. So when when we talk about stocks, you're just gonna go, yeah. All right, because you're a stock market person. We've got to keep the attention. Moving around the room, who's, who's got a couple of properties? Investment properties, Airbnb properties, anything like that? Who's our monopoly person in the room? There's got to be one. There's got to be one. Sold them all. Sold them all as well. <laughs> okay. I'll Good. Sorry? Okay. okay. And what was your name? Kate. Kate. Okay, so Kate and Carol. Because for years, we just had basically the stock market and the property market in this country. In the US, they have the stocks and the bonds. That's what they always talk about over there. They don't really have a property market. In the US, you get a, a tax deduction for paying off your own home. So there's not really much incentive to buy the house next door and rent it out to someone else. And that's why they pre predominantly go in stocks and bonds. We go in stocks and property. And they run in opposite cycles. And everybody who talks to their stockbroker says, you buy blue chip shares, then you're going to double your money in seven to 10 years. Isn't that right, Carol? That's what they tell you. <laughs> That's what they tell you. That's what the stockbroker tells you. And if you talk to the real estate guy, he says, you buy property, you're going to double your money in seven to ten years, which is also true. Right, how can they both be right? Because they run counter-cyclically. So 1987 was, a, was an interesting year. Um, 1985 is when the Wall Street movie came out. So some of us are old enough to have actually watched that at the cinema. Uh, the long-running range of the stock market over the last couple of hundred years is around about 10 to 15% per year, with all the ups and downs and, and things that happen. Uh, 1985, when the Wall Street movie came out... Come on, you're our stock market person. You're going to be the cheerleader. <laughs> Everybody got interested in the stock market. Every time I say stocks, you've got to give us a wave, otherwise we're all going to fall asleep. So long-running average of 10 or 12% per year... All of a sudden, when that movie came out in 1985, the stock market went up by 45%. And you go, wow, that's a lot, all right? And then people started to get excited about the stock market. We've seen the movie, we've seen this thing go up by 45%. What did people do? Pile in or pull out? Pile in, because this thing's going up forever, right? So the next year, it went up 56%. And I, Okay, that's a lot. That's very exciting. And anybody who'd studied the history would go, that's not right. Because averages tend to repeat. Patterns tend to repeat. That's why, like, we've had wars and things back in these periods. You know, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, all this sort of stuff. Goes up, goes down. But it looked like it was never going to come down until it actually did. Okay, because it got too big too soon and people are like, why would you pay $100 for that stock right there when it was only $10 two years ago? The company hasn't made 10 times as much money. You know, BHP hasn't discovered like super uranium or something like that. So eventually something happens and people go, that's not worth it. And we have this thing where the stock market crashes and then the cash gets up from its chair out of the stock market. Come on, come on. You got legs, come on, and moves over here to the property side of the room. Oh, you need to move, come on, give Kate a thrill. So people who'd lost their money in the stock market or who saw the stock market go crash went, that's rubbish, I'm not doing this, it's too scary, it's too dangerous, lost 30% of my money in one day, I'm going to buy a good old house, that's my picture of a house, 
Anybody who's played Monopoly will say, yep, that's a house, it's green. Um, and so what happened? 1988, we started buying property. Property prices back then, who bought a house in 1988? Can you remember? Like, Forty thousand, forty-three thousand, maybe fifty thousand. So that was nineteen eighty eight. Okay? I was selling land at the, in nineteen eighty eight for five to twenty five thousand dollars. There you go. There you go. Very, very cheap back then. But then people started to buy. People started to buy. People started to buy. And of course the property market started going up. And then what happened? Pile in or pull out? Pile in. Everybody piled in. And piled in and piled in and piled in. So we had 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. Anybody remember what happened in 1992? This had doubled in four years. Right? This one here had doubled in basically two or three. So keep a note of that. This one went up so high, and we've just recently had this again in Australia. Property market has gone really, really high, doubled in most areas. What do the central banks and the governments do as a response to the property prices going up so high? Increase the interest rates. Increase the interest rates. Thank you. So 1992 is when we had the world's greatest treasurer who said, I'm going to move the interest rates from 5% to like 13, 15. Who can remember paying that? I was selling a Santa Finance. 10% deposit on blocks of land yeah. at 21%. Jeez. And people will pay 21%. But it made it very unaffordable for you to buy these high-priced houses at high-priced interest. So then, exactly what the government can do, all they can do is put the interest rates up and put them down. That's all they can do. That's all they can do. That's their power as the government. So obviously, house prices settle down a bit because people weren't buying. And if people don't sell, the price doesn't drop like the price drops in the stock market, but it can stagnate for a long time. So meanwhile, 92 over here, were you buying property? No, couldn't afford it. Property prices had more than doubled in four years. The interest rates were ridiculous. Maybe we think about this little old share market thing again, because where else are you going to invest? Put your money under the mattress, stick it in the Commonwealth Bank. So over here, people started piling back in to the share market, which had sat flat during this period. And then, of course, share market goes up too high, too fast. And what happens again? Uh, this is back 2001. So we're looking like... The dot-com bust. Yep, absolutely. There was the, 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 the dot-com bust in 99, followed by the plane crash in 2001. So it's kind of like a double whammy. Anybody left their car windows down, better rescue them now. But again, if you'd piled in here and rode that up, then you may be aware of either getting out at this point and jumping back in here. Like if you were smart, you would have jumped out at the peak of here, bought at the bottom of there, rode that up. Four years, you would have doubled your money. Get in here, four years, you would have doubled your money. You don't have to hold it for the seven to 10 years, okay? That's what they say, because it's true, it'll double in seven to 10 years, but it sits flat for about four years and then doubles in four. And what happened here, this one sat flat four or five years, and then you know, early 2000s, property prices took off again. So from 2001 to 2006, went straight up like that. And then of course, yes, we had the global financial crisis because everybody was lending money to everybody else at ridiculous rates. and selling securities and things like that, um, and dodgy, dodgy loans. Anyone who's seen The Big Short will know the dodgy loans that were put, being put in the names of the dogs and the children and anybody who had a pulse and had a job for more than a week could get a loan to buy a property, which pushed the property prices up too high. And it was going to come crashing down again. So wouldn't it be great to know exactly when to get out of this and get in here and when to get out of that and when to get in here? Who would like to double their money every four years, rather than every seven to ten? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. Okay. Well, I was, I was going to say, like, I've studied, I've studied for 20 years over 400 years of history because you can find out the property prices in Europe from the 1600s 
you can find out the stock market prices from 1602 in some countries. And guess what? Every country, doesn't matter whether it's you know, France, Germany, you know, Iceland, every country who has property markets and stock markets operate like this every seven to 12 years. But there's indicators that'll let you know whether it's gonna be an eight year cycle or a four year cycle or a five year cycle. Longest cycle we've ever had in 200 years is 12 years. The shortest one we've ever had is five years. But it's usually that seven to 10, but you can pinpoint it. You can pinpoint it because you can look back at hundreds of years of history and know this is what's happened every single time. Is anybody interested in learning how to do that? Okay, two people. Cool. You two people, if you put your email addresses down at the back of the room, we'll give you a copy of this book. Um, I wrote this book in 2006. And in the book, I said, this is how you follow the patterns. And I also said, there's going to be a big stock market crash. There's going to be basically some proverbial hitting the fan. It's going to start in the US. It's going to affect the UK. It's going to affect Australia, not as much. And here's where you want to invest right now. now that was two years before the GFC. I knew what was coming because I'd studied all of this stuff and started to see copper price going down, repo price going up, increased debt, increased lending. You know, the Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's were overloaded. And I wrote the warning. Now, obviously, when everyone's having a party on the Titanic and all your properties are going up and all your shares are going up, no one wants to hear the kid yelling out iceberg. So I was not very popular. I only sold, I think, a couple of thousand books in Australia. Got a Money Magazine award. Um, and I sold about four copies in America. Because I was saying the Americans started this crap, right? Um, after the GFC, then I started getting phone calls from people in America saying, will you come and please talk on our radio show? Will you come and speak in New York? Will you speak in Manhattan? We want to know how you actually knew this stuff was going to happen before it happened. Because right? history proves the future. Exactly, exactly. If you look at history, you will figure out what the So not only did that one predict the GFC, but also told you how to predict everything going forward and also gives you the stocks and the shares and the things. I hope you're smart enough to actually know which is a good property to invest into just by driving past it or having a look at it. Um, but obviously stocks and shares is something that's a bit more complicated for most people. So that'll give you the secrets. Um, interestingly enough, yes, we did predict the tech wreck, um, warned people about the 9-11-2001, didn't know the planes were going to hit the building, but did know the stock market was at a very, very high point. Shares in Google had recently moved from $10 up to $140. Some of these other companies were just ridiculous. After the tech wreck, people piled into the value stocks. The value stocks went up. Not sustainable. It's going to come down. Again, didn't know the plane crash was going to happen, but knew there's going to be a pivotal event. Okay. A um, couple of years ago, in our newsletter, on the crypto newsletter, because I, I report on macroeconomics, so this is what's happening in the world. This is how that affects the stock market. This is how that affects crypto, because crypto is only a very small part of the investment market. Uh, October 2019 said repo market has skyrocketed from 2% to 17%. That's the money that the banks lend each other. And when that, that goes off, you know, there's not enough financial, there's not enough cash in the system, basically, for the banks to lend to each other. Also, the copper price was going down. And I went, ding, ding. Those two things happened in 2006, which is when we forecast the GFC. And the repo market went, went up, and the copper price went down. We just said, hey, get the hell out of stocks. We don't know what's going to happen. Might be, yeah, there's always a trigger event, whether it's a plane crash or the president's been shot or whatever. We don't know what's going to happen or when, but sooner or later that stock market is going to crash. And we said to people at the time, get into gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Now, the disease was still in a little lab in China. We didn't know about the disease. But six months after we made the prediction, bang, that crashed down. Stock market wiped out by about minus 60%. So if you had your money in there, tough luck. But if you bought gold, silver, and Bitcoin, like we'd suggested, gold went up by 50%, silver went up by 100%, Bitcoin went up by 600 So when most of the world was going straight down, you could have been riding the elevator back up. 
So either you think that's valuable or you don't, that's okay. Um, as I say, we give away all the secret sauce, we give away the information in the book. You can have a best selling book for free, and we give away the information in the crypto as well. So, I'll oh. tell you about that one because it's very, very new. As I say, stock market's been around since the 1600s, crypto market's been around 15 years. It's very new. We don't have hundreds of years to draw on. But the thing about the crypto market is it's kind of like the stock market, just sped up very quickly. So you've got a, basically 100 years worth of gains in 15 years. Very volatile. Anybody who's looked at it for more than half a minute knows it's very volatile. But also some ridiculous gains. So the techniques that I'm showing, sorry? Um, it's just, it's speed. All it is is speed. So the stock market in Australia, they ring the opening bell at 10.30 in the morning, they ring the closing bell 3.30 in the afternoon, and that's it. And no more trading on Friday afternoon, obviously Saturday, Sunday, we have a day off, and then Monday morning, 10.30, and they'll, they'll trade for like, you know, five or six hours a day. And then you'll hear someone say, oh, Hong Kong market's just opened, and then they'll be trading Hong Kong market, or the US market's just opened. So they'll be trading five or six hours a day. This thing's running 24-7 in every country in the world. So while you're sleeping, there's someone in India who's buying this. You know, 52% of people in Turkey hold cryptocurrency. Like, I haven't been to Turkey. I don't know anybody who lives in Turkey. But these guys are just on the ball. Haven't they, haven't they had a massive devaluation? Yes, yeah. That's and they no longer trust their government. They no longer trust their currency. And they say, okay, this crypto thing, it, it bounces along like this but I'd rather have this thing that's bouncing along like this than the paper cash in my wallet, which is guaranteed to be worth 50% less next month. So you'll find there's, there's countries like Nigeria is also another one where crypto adoption is very, very fast. Yeah, yeah. Com uh, countries who have had problems with their currency, had problems with their government, that have had problems with the IMF, so they're getting into it. But crypto, again, there's patterns, they're recognisable patterns. And again, if you've got the time and you've got the research to sit down and, and do all the work, great. You, know, you can research your own stocks and shares and put them in your self-managed super fund, or you can hire someone to do it for you because you're too busy doing your other things. So that's what we did with the crypto because most of my clients, when I was investing in stocks, they didn't really want to know. They said, oh, I like Coca-Cola and I always fly Qantas, so can you get me some shares in that? But as for the other stuff, you just do it. I don't care, as long as I make money and as long as we're not investing in tobacco or whatever, you know, their, whatever their fa least favourite vice was. They tell you what not to invest in, just go and do it for me. So that's what we decided to do with the cryptocurrency. But tonight, I'm just going to teach you how to do it yourself. Because if you're going to do it, and if you're not going to do it with us, the least you can do is do it safely. All right? There's a lot of people who have been scammed because crypto is what they call pseudo-anonymous. You can see where the money's going, you can track it all on the blockchain, but you don't necessarily know who the person owning that wallet was. So if someone wants to scam you, you won't know who scammed you, but you can see where the money is and what they spent it on. Kind of cold comfort, but disclaimer, standard disclaimer, this is not financial advice, this is just information, there's no recommendations. I might mention one or two coins, but please don't say that. It's just an example. Don't put any money into Dogecoin or Peppycoin or any of those ones. So it's our, our classic question here. All investment involves risk. Everything involves risk. Driving here tonight involves some risk. Okay? Now, my favourite two little puppies, I've just tossed them out the aeroplane. One's wearing a parachute, one is not. So, who's taking the most risk? This little one here? Okay. Everybody agree with that? Um, yeah, well, this one's going to land on a cushion of air. <laughs> no, I'm just mean. It's just like throw them out of a paper. The risk for the puppy without the parachute 
that's the perfect answer. That's the answer that everybody gives. It's also wrong. Puppy without the parachute, absolutely 100% guaranteed to hit the ground and go splat. No quibbles, no question, no whatever. Even if he lands in water, he's going to go splat. Right? The puppy with the parachute has got the risk. What if the string breaks? What if the parachute tangles? What if I land in power lines? What if, what if, what if? Okay. So, yeah, going splat doesn't sound like a pleasant activity, but it's the difference between 100% guaranteed to do what you think is going to do versus there's a chance that five or six different things can happen. So what we look at when we're investing is say, there is five or six different things that can happen. Every now and then, there's going to be a plane crash. Not necessarily terrorists, maybe just a drunk pilot or whatever. Every now and then, there's going to be a plane crash. So you don't put all your money into an airline stock. You have a diversification. You say, okay, every now and then, there's a plane crash. What do people do? They pull their money out of the airline stock. The stock goes down. What do they put it into? Some other safer options. And again, look back through history to see what went up when this went down. I had borrowed half a million dollars to invest in the stock market before 9-11. I took out insurance in case there was a drop in the market that I could just hand the stocks back. I didn't have to pay for them. I also diversified and obviously when the airline stocks went down and holiday planning, flight centre, whatever, whatever, when they went down, I had stock in Telstra, which went up. Everyone in Australia was calling their friends in America saying, I love you, are you dead? You know? And people thought there was going to be a war on, the big thing against the terrorists, the war on terror. So they started buying tin food and duct tape and bottled water. Woolworths and Coles went up. So diversification and knowing what's going to do and how to plan because the risk is going to happen, but you can protect yourself. All right? And I like that you like the little stack hat. So... You either sit down and you plan it all out or you find someone to do it for you. And this has, again, been my job for the last 30 years. So I can't see anybody who's taking notes, maybe one person taking notes. So what I'm going to teach you is how we've been running this crypto mutual fund, the secret source of how we've beaten Bitcoin every year for seven years in a row, how we've made more than 10,000% six times wasn't just a fluke, okay? Everybody knows the story of, oh, you know, my, I've heard of crypto, my friend lost all his money on crypto, or I heard of this kid in America who made a million bucks on crypto. But have you ever actually met the person? Because a lot of these are urban legends, right? Mm -hmm. No one actually says, yes, the kid's name was Daryl Smith and he lived down here or whatever. I've done it. I've got friends who have done it as well. 13,000% on one coin. And again, that was just one. So if you want to learn how to do that, I'll teach you how to do that. It might be a good idea to take some notes. Write on your hand if you haven't got any paper. It's four steps, only four steps. In the book here, there's nine steps to choose your own stocks. A little bit more complex because obviously companies come out with earnings reports and all this sort of stuff. There's no earnings in crypto because they're not manufacturing goods. The actual crypto is the service nine times out of ten. So what we want to look at to choose your own crypto is a lot easier than choosing your own stocks. Four steps. And I'll give away the acronym because I give away all the secrets. C-O-I-N, that's what you want to write down. Write down on your head. Go on, Tom. You haven't got a pen? Grab one. Steal one. Ask Patrick for a pen. There's bits of paper down the back of the room if you want a bit of paper. It's, it's literally like there's four things we've got to write down. Could make you 10,000%. <laughs> no notes. promises. <laughs> like two pages. Man, that's awesome. And for Nelly. Yeah. It's clever, isn't it? Because there's Bitcoin and there's Peppy coin and there's Dogecoin, so like, make an acronym that's easy to remember. I've got three pens in my bag down there, Pat. If anybody needs a pen. Yeah, just right on the top. 
<laughs> what do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick. <laughs> or Bob's pen. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, true. All right. So, C O I N, written down your page vertically. First thing we check is the C suite. Okay, you've got the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, the CSO, whoever. These be people with the fancy C suite in their title have a look at those people. Because you'll, someone will mention a great investment to you and you'll go, okay, I want to check this out. You go onto their website. Who's in the team? If it's a scam, guaranteed the team will be anonymous. There won't be any photos, there won't be anybody's page there. It's anonymous, they don't want you to know who they are because they're going to steal your money and run away with it. Right? Sometimes the scammers are a little bit clever and they know that, oh, if we don't have any photos, people won't give us their money, so they'll get stock images of the internet. Right? So if you see the C-suite and they're all ridiculously good looking, you do a right click and do an image search and go, oh yeah, that's stock image from Shutterstock portfolio, blah, 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 right? It's not a real person. Um, the other thing to check, and this, this again, it takes you 30 seconds. Jump onto LinkedIn, do a search for the name of the company and find out, okay, who's the CEO of this company? Who's the, who's the you know, marketing officer or whatever? And see if they're on LinkedIn working for the company. See if their title matches that. Because I can start a scam company and say, yes, I've got the CEO and it's Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's a real guy. He really exists. There's a real photo of him. But you go on LinkedIn, he doesn't work for this company. You know, obviously made up. So we're looking for red flags. If you get four red flags, if you get one red flag, you run away screaming. All right? Green flags only. Again, 30 seconds. You know, this will save you a lot of money. I've, I've met a couple of people... One, just like two weeks ago, I got a phone call from this guy who said, look, hey, you don't know me, but I was friends with your partner back in high school, like 20, 30 years ago. I've heard you know about crypto. And I said, yeah, I know a few things, still learning a lot of things. He said, my dad's having trouble getting his money out of his crypto wallet. Can you help him? I said, how old's your dad? Because we've got clients who are in the 70s, 80s. We've got clients who are blind and that sort of stuff. I'm like, it's okay, we can help him out. He said, Dad's 83. And I said, cool, okay. Um, is it a technology issue or has Dad got some sort of physical impairment? Like, no, 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 Dad's all over technology. He's perfectly physically capable, but he just can't manage to pull this particular money out of this particular wallet. Can you help him? Okay. So he just happened to be in the next suburb over. So I drove over there sat down with dad and dad was all over it like he had his password he had his two-factor authentication on his phone you know typing in the numbers like security up the wazoo and i thought this guy's really good because most people they you know they write down their password they take a photo of it on their phone and someone hacks their phone or whatever so he was super duper secure and i was looking at this he had almost five hundred thousand dollars in this crypto wallet that he'd been trading and I've seen every stock market scam, every property scam, every gambling scam, every crypto scam over the last 30 years. This one had me fooled for about 30 minutes. What they'd done is they just made up their own coin and they gave it a name that was one letter different from a real one and the logo was copied of a copy so the thing that twigged me after like 35 minutes of trying to get this money out of the wallet was the logo wasn't quite right. And then when we did manage to transfer like $2 of that money onto the exchange, the exchange didn't recognise it as real money. So he'd been putting real money into this wallet. The scammers had been giving him made up monopoly money and taking his real money. Literally half a million bucks. His life savings. Gone. And I'm just sitting there going, shit, how do I tell this guy? Lucky he's, you know, his son and his daughter-in-law are in the room. Like, I just got to tell them and they can tell him while I scarp up because I don't want to be the one to break it to him. But the person who was helping him was actually scamming him. So recognise the scams. O for the offering. What does it do? All right? When we invest... In a company such as BHP, what does BHP do? Well, they rape and pillage the environment and they give us lithium and coal. Right? Easy. 
What does West farmers do? Well, they also rape and pillage the environment and they give us coals and they give us bunnings and that's what they do, right? That's how they make their money. Can understand that. What does the investment property do? Well, you build it and someone sits in there and they pay your rent. That's pretty easy to understand. If you don't understand what the offering is, then get the hell out of Dodge. You know? Dogecoin, appropriate Dogecoin. What does it do? Makes you laugh. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It makes you laugh, right? It was a joke. It was literally created as a joke. And the guys who created it said we created it as a joke. And they didn't even hold any, they just gave it all away. It doesn't do anything. And what does Bitcoin do? Well, Bitcoin is a store of value. There's 21 million Bitcoin in the world. I don't know how many ounces of gold there are in the world or how many ounces of silver there are in the world, but they're not making any more of that stuff. Which is why when gold backed the currency in the US and silver backed the currency in the UK, we had stable economies. We had that wonderful Bretton Woods period where there was no financial crises for about 40 years. Now it's backed by nothing. Bitcoin is a scarce commodity. It's classified as a commodity, same as gold and silver, even though you can't pick it up. It's got digital scarcity. It's also a means of exchange. Like You can email, basically, value to someone else. Same as sending them a cat picture now is a lot faster than when you used to send the cat picture to someone in the 1970s through the post. So Bitcoin has a use case. It's got two use cases in there. Ethereum has a use case. It's a network like railroad tracks that a lot of other tokens, 80 or 90% of the other tokens run on the Ethereum network. It does things, it gets used up like silver or like oil, okay? Some of these things, you know, you might buy a coin and you buy $100 worth of coin and then it translates into $150 worth of vouchers at the laundromat or whatever, you know? It's got a use case of a token of being used up. If you can't understand what it is, don't think you're stupid. It's because someone's trying to swindle you. Right? They use a lot of big sparkly terms and a lot of big words and say, we're going to put avocados on the blockchain to make sure they're really legit, sort of, you know, not being poisoned. Avocados. I don't know. You know, just go to Whole Foods. Look at the offering. If you can't understand it, get rid of it. If you don't think it's actually doing something, like putting avocados on the blockchain, how does that help me? I don't know, they're either organic or they're not organic. You either trust the person who's selling them or you go home and you invest in your own spectrograph. But most people don't need the blockchain for avocados. Okay, third thing, I, investors, find out who else is investing into this project. The investors are either going to be geniuses or idiots, like these puppies who are trying to lick something on the outside of the glass. There's plenty of idiots investing in Dogecoin and Peppycoin and these other sort of things. Um, the story I, I like to tell here is one of our first investments back in 2016, 2017 um, was in Powerledger. Now, Powerledger was basically a couple of guys in Perth who were empty nesters and they had solar panels all over their roof because when, they're, when they had the kids at home, the kids are obviously you know, charging their phones and running their music and doing all the things that kids do. I don't understand children anymore. My kids have moved out now. Um, and these two guys are saying, we're generating so much solar power, but because it's just me and the missus at home, we're not using it. And when we're sending all this excess power back to the grid, we only get 10 cents. Anybody relate to that? But at night time, when we draw the power, we've got to pay 30 cents. And these guys are making all the money. It's not fair. It's silly. You know? I should be able to sell my power to the bloke down the road for 20 cents instead of getting 10 cents from Energex. And he's going to be happy because he's paying 20 cents instead of 30 cents. Everybody wins. And these two guys are just sort of having this discussion over a beer. Wouldn't that be great if we could actually sell power to the next door neighbours? And one of them who's an engineer said, um, you realise the energy grid is all connected. Everybody's connected. The internet is all connected we could actually do this. So they sat down with a napkin, as you do, worked it out and said, yeah, we could actually do this. We could sell power to each other and to our friends and family rather than selling it to the grid, cut out the middleman and everybody's happy because you're making twice as much on your excess power, they're paying half the price for the power that they buy. 
great idea, great solution. It was just a couple of guys in Perth. If they want to list on the stock exchange, it's a million dollars minimum as a bond just to put up there to apply. And then you've got to get the lawyers and then you've got to get prospectus and all this sort of stuff. They didn't have that kind of money. They're like, 600 bucks, we can make a token. And we'll just call it this solar power, power ledger token and we'll put it on the blockchain and we'll tell a few people around Perth about it. And then someone who knows a guy, who knows a guy, who knows a guy, six degrees of separation, talks to their mate and says, hey Dick, heard you got some solar panels on your little island out there, Necker Island. And Dickie Branson goes, yeah, I have. And he said, have you heard of this power ledger thing where you can actually sell to people rather than selling to the grid? And Dickie Branson goes, sounds like a great idea, I'm in. So that's an example Probably took a little bit longer to jump in. But an example of an intelligent investor, okay? Richard Branson has multiple billion dollar companies. He's got teams of people who can do the research for him. He's probably smarter than most of us in the room, not you. But he's got a lot of other smart people who can, who can work for him. So you get five brains combined together, it's going to be a lot more than one. So that's a green flag if we've got someone of that caliber who's not only an intelligent person but also has very intelligent people working for them who can do the research and say, okay, if it's good enough for Richard Branson, maybe it's good enough for me, provided we've got the other two steps as well. Okay, so what were the other two steps? I'm going to ask the person who's not taking notes. What was the C stand for? Chief. <laughs> Chief, yes, very good. Yep. And the O? The O was for um, the offering. Was it tangible? Excellent. Excellent. All right. So third step there. And final step, this is our little network. So sooner or later, whether you've got stocks, whether you've got property, whether you've got whatever you've got, sooner or later you're going to want to sell some. Okay? In this country, 95% of the stocks that you buy pay a dividend. So you can actually get a check twice a year from these guys. If you hold stocks, you know that you get the dividend check. Uh, in the US, 95% of their stocks do not pay a dividend. So in order to actually free up some cash, Elon has to sell some Tesla shares. Bill Gates has to sell some Microsoft shares. Every time the price goes through the roof, he might sell off 5 or 10% of his holdings. Okay? And it's easy to sell shares in Microsoft and Tesla because they're household names. Lots of people know about them. If you had shares in Coca-Cola and you wanted to sell them to fund your retirement or your trip or your cruise or whatever, could you sell shares in Coca-Cola to anybody in this room? Absolutely. We've all heard of it. Could you share, sell shares in Crazy Dave's Winery, Hunter Valley, number three, because the last two times it went bankrupt? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> You want to look at the network, so when, when someone's saying this is a great project, you've got to look at it, you check it out on Facebook, check it out on Twitter. How many people are following this account? How many people are reading their newsletter? How many people are talking about it? Because Pepe was not a household name six months ago. It is now, and for all the wrong reasons, but you know, Tesla didn't exist 20 years ago. So some of these companies might be great, and they come out of nowhere, like Facebook came out of nowhere. We all used to be on MySpace, and then Facebook came out. You've got to find out, is there a lot of people around? Because someday I want to sell my shares. The, the thing goes up by 300%, but if you can't find a buyer, you didn't make any profit at all. Okay? So that's it. That's the trick. That's the secret sauce. That's how we've run the fund for the last seven years. That's how we've outperformed Bitcoin every year. That's how we've made gains of more than 10,000% because we find out about these little projects. Someone said to us, oh, there's this thing called Solana. It's like 12 cents. And we have a look and we go, who's the CEO? What's the offering? What does it do? Oh, Solana's offering was actually, it's like another Ethereum. It's like another network that people can build things on. And at first there was only people building like little games and stuff, but eventually you, that's how they test it because games doesn't matter if you win or lose. But then once you've tested it with that, then you can start building hospital records and you can start building big transactions and things on it. I thought, okay, this thing, it might be like the iPhone that destroyed the Nokia. It might be the new Solana, might be the thing that destroys Ethereum. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. 
So we did the research, went, the offering's good, investors good, network's good, people are talking about this, we'll buy this little thing that's like you know, 13 cents. We risked 1% of the portfolio. So find a picture somewhere, there. So 1% of our portfolio is like this much. And if we lost 1%, we can recover from that. That's okay. That's fine. Right? But what happened is the 1% suddenly turned into 15%. Because it was just massively increased in price about 12 months later when everybody else found out about it and started buying into it. It went from 13 cents up to about $12. And we go, okay, that's great for us. You know, we've just made like 9,763%. But what if something happens to it now? What if someone comes out with an even better one of those and that one crashes? So that's the stage where we go, we're going to sell off some of that, rebalance, and put it into these other things because that's how you protect yourself is diversification. Now, if you bought Qantas shares and the Qantas shares tripled in value, great, but now you've got risk. Diversify into the other things. So again, that's how we run the fund. If you guys run your own investments like that. I'm not saying you're guaranteed of making thousands of percent, but number one, you're going to be safe from 92% of the scams that are out there. And there is more than 20,000 of them right now. Um, there's about 3,000 coins that aren't scams. So your odds are pretty bad unless you know what you're doing. And protect yourself from the scams, invest into the right things, diversify, or you can let us do it for you. Um, that's Bitcoin in the orange. And we've kicked its butt most of the time. Occasionally, you know, it might have won for a month or two. But again, diversification. Because when Bitcoin goes down, something else is going to go up. We've invested into the crypto exchanges. So if someone comes out with Bitcoin 2.0 that's better than Bitcoin, people are going to go on the exchanges and sell their old stuff and buy their new stuff, which means we still make money. We've invested in the fiber optics. So the more crypto, the more self-driving cars, the more smart fridges, the more money we make. I've been going for a while, been on a few TV shows, done all the whole media thing, traveled around, talk a lot. And that's what we do. So again, if you want a copy of that book for free, email address down to Patrick at the back. Um, if you want to have a chat and ask questions not in front of everybody, then we can set up a phone call for you in the next couple of days. We've got some space in the diary tomorrow and Monday and Tuesday next week. For any questions, anybody who wants to find out speci more specific information. Obviously, this is a lot of general stuff, and I don't know... When's the next crash coming? Um, that's a great question. I get asked that about nine times a day. Young Patrick asked me in the trip, on the car, on the way here. And I said, I've got it in my calendar. And I've got it on a specific date in my calendar, which I won't tell you what date it is. But if I get out here and it goes up another 10 or 20% and then crashes, I'm okay. If I get out a day after the crash and I get out there and then it goes down there, I'm still okay because I've been in there for the ride up. You know? I've done that numerous times, but again, I mean, it's research that's available to anybody, it's just most people don't use it. So I did literally, I bought my house in 1999, before the tech wreck, and before the 9-11 plane crash, and like for 18 months, the price was exactly the same as what I paid for it. But then three, four years later, it had gone up by 260%. And that's when it was like 2006 when I was writing the book and going, holy crap, there's some stuff going on here. Time for me to get out of that, take that money, put it into something else. And if, you, if you're clever enough to learn from history, and there's literally a clock in there so you can set your clock by it, um, right in the back, then you can double your money every three or four years. If you understand crypto, you can double your money in less than a year. Okay, and again, safely, by diversifying, not taking big risks. We're not talking about casino. Yep. How do you feel about the quantum based coins? Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those phrases like artificial intelligence that's thrown around a lot. Um, there is no such thing as a quantum computer. Everyone wants to say they've got one or they're working on on one. 
Yeah. Um, but it's impossible. And like the, the artificial intelligence, like you can ask ChatGPT and it can tell you an answer to a story, but ChatGPT doesn't know the end of its sentence. Like it's, if I start telling you a story and I've got Alzheimer's and I start telling you a story and halfway through I forget why I was telling you the story and then I forget what the ending of the story was and was there three little pigs or was there four penguins? I can't remember. ChatGPT just picks the next logical word in a sequence. So it will lie to you, but it doesn't know it's lying. It just thinks the most, next most likely word. And then, of course, you've got the artificial intelligence that you tell it to draw a picture, and it'll draw a picture. But it can't recognise a picture. So there's lots of very, very specific little bits of intelligence that can paint a picture, it can read a chapter, it can do this for you, but it can't actually function anywhere near like a brain can. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why we have the pick the stop signs and pick the buses, because the computer can't recognise those things. So that, that's how we stay in front of them at the moment. But yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of marketing words that are thrown out there, and most of it is just hoopla, and when you look at it, you just go, well, the offering. It's not the offering. It's, that technology doesn't exist. Are there things so. that do both the electrical as well as quantum? Um, I don't believe anyone does a quantum. Oh, there, there's a quant coin. Yeah, 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 but it doesn't do quantum computing. So. Someone's, someone's <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's very clever computers out there. There's computers smart enough to beat a human at chess. But again, that, that computer can play chess really well. It can't recognise a stop sign. It can't tell you your star sign. It can't go shopping for you. It can't do any of those sort of things. So yeah, we're a long, long way away from those sort of things. But again, there's... Read through, read through a few things or find someone who can actually spot them and say, yep, that's, that's not real. That doesn't happen. So avocados don't exist on the blockchain. Bank coins will come into being. Absolutely. Because the central banks want to hold power. They always have. They always will. They want to hold power. Whether they can or not is another thing entirely. How would that interact with the rest of the crypto sphere? Um, well, because at the moment... Have, they have predominance in terms of control, yeah. which they would do because mm. they'd make sure that they did. Yeah. They're going to marginalise the other cryptos that have more power if they were freed up, because mm -hmm. those other cryptos would completely wipe the floor with the central bank digital coins. Uh, horses for courses, I think. So. Well, because uh, because there's no there's no control over uh, over the crypto. Um, we, yeah. Because yeah. you know, it's pseudo anonymous. Yeah. No, but also because you don't have a government writing uh, conditions into the contract on the blockchain preventing mm. you. From spending your money after six o'clock in an off-license. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the one. I mean, we've, we've had, even before, even before the blockchain, there's been these um, debit cards where they can pay people on welfare with the card and they can use it for rent, but they can't use it for alcohol. Or they can buy food, but they can't buy cigarettes. And in, in the States, of course, they had the, the stamp system, the food stamp system. So the government wants to control it and stop you from spending on things that they sh you know, you shouldn't buy cigarettes and you shouldn't buy chocolate cake and you shouldn't have fun on a weekend. Like, the government wants to control stuff, but there's still horses for courses. Like, the US dollar has existed since 1913, right? Basically 100 years. In that time, it's been <coughs> rapidly hyperinflated, devalued, lost 99.7% of its value. But we still have gold. We still have gold coins. And if you were around in ancient Rome or ancient Greece or ancient Egypt, you still had gold coins back then. And you can still use them. Gold, silver, platinum, whatever. Those things still exist. And you can have Bitcoin and you can have your, you know, the, the currency, the CBDC that they want to pay you in. And they can program that, but they can't program this. And that's why it's, it's been a long time trying to get the legislation. And the SEC is still fighting about it in the, in the US because there's something there they can't control. If enough people had gold coins, you would find Executive Order 6102 where the US government went around and confiscated the gold coins from people. Right? Confiscated them and said, oh, look, here's 20 bucks. You can't hold gold anymore because too many people were holding gold. And meanwhile, the US government was going bankrupt because it was after the Great Depression. And then two years later, they went, oh, oh if, if you want your gold back, you can buy it, but now it's 35. All right? So the government will always try and control, you know, keep control and keep power. But there's things you can do because there were some people who didn't give their gold coins in. 
There's people who own shares in gold mining companies that didn't have to give them in. There's people who owned artworks and things like that. So again, diversification. Or if you hold the gold and silver in your, in your hand, are they going to get it off you? Uh, well, brute force, gold detectors, guns, you know, how does, how does the government keep control in any nation? It's always violence. I'll, I'll give you that one. Back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've, they've got to find it, but they've got ways and means of finding it, is what I'm saying. So, I mean, if you put it out and buried it in, in the back of beyond, whatever, good luck to you. Um, but, but the donor, you, do you agree that the donor is actually destitute having had the funeral yet? Because this is now started, and yeah. when you look at all these various different countries, they're now actually, what did I read? Something in Indonesia and some other countries now decided the pest, not to do it with the peso dollar anymore. That's yep. going to change. I can't remember where it The BRICS dollar. Whatever they were yeah, yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if we just said, like, the, the US dollar has lost 99.7% of its purchasing power in 100 years. Every paper currency throughout history has eventually devalued to zero. The Chinese had paper currency in the 12th century. It was backed by gold at first, and then they denatured it. You know, the, the Egyptians and the, the Romans, again, they had silver currency, and then they'd start putting lead in it. They devalued their own currency, eventually went broke. So, yeah, it's, it's totally dead. But we've got the opportunity. We can still buy gold, silver, we can still buy Bitcoin. And the fun thing is, like, if you've got a million bucks worth of gold and you want to escape to El Salvador, good luck. Because you can't get through the airport with it, right? You can't get through the airport with $10,000 in cash because they've got cash sniffing dogs. But if you've got a little USB thing in your pocket, you can walk out with a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin and no one will ever know. So that's the fun part. And that's like the guy who actually created Bitcoin was a massive gold bug. And he's like, what if we could get gold that we could email to each other and store on a USB device? Who do you think created Bitcoin? Um, I've got my theories, but the, the original Twitter account was anonymous. Everything was anonymous. But he, he used to post a lot about gold. And he started reading other people's and, and, and computer technicians and working together with these people. He, he was a massive gold bug. We know, well, I say he. Could have been she. Could have been five people. Um, but on that, on that Twitter account and the email account, they always talked a lot about gold. And then, how can we make it even better? So, and that's... No, no. No. How about CIA soil? Yeah, but they wouldn't have tested it on the, on the geeks and the nerds. And like some of these guys are multi, multi, multi millionaires and no one knows. Because they've got literally 10,000 bitcoins in their pocket and they don't have the flashy Lamborghinis, they don't have the flashy, sh flashy house. And there's the person next door to you, could be a, a trillionaire and you wouldn't even know. All right. How long have you been running this? Uh, Boston the Boston coin, seven years. And how much you made? Uh, how much percentage of, has it risen? Um, great question. I don't know off the top of my head, but we do do a, um, a newsletter every month. And the last one came out yesterday. I should have that you're, figure you're on it. You're talking about 13,000? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's on, like, when 1% when of your portfolio makes 13,000%, that doesn't mean the whole lot of the portfolio made that. Okay. So right. when you average it out, like, you know, Bitcoin might have gone up by 10%, and that was more of our thing. So, yeah, it's possible to get those gains. And if you want to try a casino, we can teach you how to do that. But the way we do it is keeping it safe, keeping it simple, so over time... It's always moving in an upward angle. We, we, do, we do publish the charts and the prices every month, and literally, like, it came out yesterday. Um, it's, on, it's on the website every month, so that's why I say you can go back there and find out in October when we warned about getting out of the markets before the pandemic. You know, and we can tell you, you can see what we're looking at, where we're going, what we're doing. All the predictions there, all the information is there, because we don't want to have any secrets. Um, I can't remember everything off the top of my head, I'm sorry. But it's, it's all written down. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. We've been for a while. We're going to have a 10 minute break, a uh, copy of condiments, and we'll come back with more updates. And um, thank you again, once again, for all a great presentation, some really good tips. And the, the message I always get about the first presenters and in finance is always that coin is easy to remember. It's all about financial literacy, and that's the key lowers your risk and increases your pro profitability potential uh, and 
dealing with the right people, which is always a good thing. So, face to face, Jeremy uh, is open for phone calls, emails, and appointments. Uh, deal with the uh, next, um, um, the lady's name, sorry, having operations. Your PA. Uh, Mulyani or? Uh, Muli or Stacy? Stacy. Yep, yep. Um, great question. On the website, um, but also we'd like to call you. So if you give us your phone number and your email, we can send you the book and you can have a chat. We can schedule a time to have a chat with you. Any chance I need to buy that physical book from you tonight in cash? Um, <laughs> This, this book has been out of print for many years, which is why this one says Reggie's Edit on it. Because um, you cannot find a copy of this book uh, anywhere anymore. So I'm giving away the e-book. Yeah, this is, like I didn't even save myself a clean copy. This is the one that Reggie has gone through and edited the spelling mistakes. So, yeah. It's been out of print for a while. You still, still get it on Kindle on Amazon. Um, I think it's about five bucks on Amazon, but um, yeah. Uh, we've been doing them every month, and there's one person who's asked for weekly. Um, but again, we're tracking sort of year by year, because they don't put up the interest rates every single week. It's every month they have a meeting. Um, it's really, really interesting, in, in May, on, on Twitter, we actually said what we predicted for the interest rate rises, and we said um, May, May up, June up, July pause, August pause, September pause, October pivot, I think. can't remember. But it's written down there in, in May what we actually said. And so far, the last four months, we've been correct every single month yeah. of what the Reserve Bank's going to do. Because, again, based on history, there's only two things they can do, and they do it in response to what's already going on. So when you know how they work, you can go, oh, I know what's going to happen. You know, if, if 3 o'clock come round, you pretty well know 4 o'clock's going to come round. It's okay. that simple. <laughs> What's that? The crash. The crash. Uh, yeah, and in the last hundred years, September has been a negative month more than 60% of the time. So this one, this September that just closed was actually a positive one, uh, which is an anomaly because it usually doesn't. But when, in the past, when September has closed positive, October, November, December have all been positive. Yeah, likely, yeah, likely. Not 100% guaranteed, because nothing is. Um, but if it's happened you know, 20 times in the last 100 years that A, B, C, and then a D, I'd bet on D. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> All good. Thank you. part of my talk was the pen.